This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting today's show is Lee Schultz, Iowa State University Extension Livestock Economist, with a cattle market update. Lee discusses recent farm labor and cold storage reports from the USDA. K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts continues the show with information about deer and things to consider when deciding to feed them, because people might be feeding more wildlife than just deer. Finishing today's show is K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook as he looks at three things dairy farmers can do to reduce the spread of summer mastitis. Because of the conditions, dairy farmers often see an increase in mastitis in the herd during the summer. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today on this Tuesday, and we start our show with a cattle market update. And for that update, we have Iowa State University Extension Livestock Economist Lee Schultz. Lee, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So starting off the cattle market update, kind of how we usually do, talking about feeder, fed cattle, and cash. Yeah, so I think when you you look at the last week, uh, certainly live cattle futures put in a rather bullish performance. You know, if you look across the contracts, you know, up near a dollar or more across the board, certainly in line with with the fundamentals as we're seeing rather tight supplies with a pretty tighter slaughter week with, with the holiday week last week. Um, certainly that fell over into the cash market. You know, prices were a dollar to two to four dollars higher overall in, in cash. Certainly as as we're looking at the tighter supplies and packers looking for cattle. You know, when I think that about the slaughter levels, I think June is going to be a really important to monitor. Um, I think we're looking at rather current fed cattle supplies, and that's certainly shown out in, in both cash and, and futures prices and seeing how that continues to progress into June will be important. That may say that we do see a bit of a a higher low than we maybe expect during the summer months. Feeder cattle, you know, we did take a step back as you look at futures prices. Certainly some of that I think is related to a stronger corn market uh, this last week where corn prices were, were up across the board as you look at 2023 contracts. Certainly I think some of that spilled over into the feeder cattle trade. And another portion of the cattle market, box beef cutouts. Box beef, uh, quite a bit volatile uh, last week. uh, Where you seeing it? It printed down on Tuesday and Wednesday, but stronger really to to begin the week and and end the week. I think some of that certainly has to do with holiday week. We'll kind of see a lot of uh, strength and hopefully strength in in purchases here post-holiday weeks as retailers are restocking some of those shelves. You know, I think... Uh, with the lower prices the, the week before, uh, that provided some buy-in opportunities. So last week, that's some of the strength uh, that we've seen. And we kind of hope we continue to see that into the next holidays as we're thinking about Father's Day and then into the 4th of July. You know, we're not that far um, around the corner from that. So this is the key time to see the strength in box beef. And hopefully that, that follows through to, to what we're seeing for fed cattle prices. Another portion, kind of off the cattle market topic exactly, but cold storage for beef. What is that looking like? A recent report came out from the USDA. We had uh, USDA's report of cold storage at the end of of April. So the data is a little bit delayed. It's just how long it takes USDA to to compile that data and report that data. Uh, But we had that report on Wednesday, May 24th which details the frozen supplies we have on hand for for beef, but also pork and poultry and and, and veal and lamb is included in there. Generally, when we look at individual industries there, you know, it was rather supportive, those levels for beef and lamb, uh, but pork really remains relatively ample. That's certainly, I think, really suppressing prices as as we look at at the pork market. You know, we dig into into beef uh, in particular, you know, we were down about 16% compared to to year ago levels, beef and cold storage. You know, I'll I'll remind our listeners that that beef and cold storage, I like to kind of use it as a barometer. It means that, you know, if it's not stacking up in cold storage, that means it's moving through the supply chain relatively well, right? And so that's one indication that, that we're continuing to see strong demand and at least quantity demanded for beef as those cold storage levels remain relatively low if we compare to last year, especially. 
April 2023 compared to March 2023 or April 2022, numbers are actually down, which is a good thing. That, that is a good thing. Again, so that, that really means that, you know, when we're thinking about pulling on supplies, uh, that's less supply we have to pull on in cold storage. That means we have to pull on the supplies of, of cattle, right? So, and as we know, cattle supplies are tighter. Um, that means supportive of prices. So, you know, if we've seen those, those supplies relatively ample, like they are in the pork market, that means that product is, is somewhat building up, right? So there's an available supply already there. And so that's not as supportive of prices as something as we look at the cattle industry, uh, where the, those beef supplies and cold storage uh, remain relatively tight. And is that a good positive thing looking back down the line to producers? It, it certainly is. So as, as we think about demand and derived demand, that all trickles back to, to producers. So, you know, as, as we think about how high we can push prices going forward, right? So we know the supply side of things is working in the advantage of, of producers, right? We're continuing to see tighter supplies of cattle, uh, tighter supplies of beef, uh, but demand is very important as well. So ultimately, how high we can push these prices and how fast we can push these prices is going to be dictated by demand. And so, you know, thinking about demand and, and uh, how strong demand we have both domestically and on the export market, cold storage gives us a hint of that. Um, it's also a supply-related factor, but it's one of those pieces of data we look at monthly. But again, I would say it's it's relatively supportive here of cattle prices moving forward. And another report to touch on that came out on May 24th was the farm labor. And obviously, that's an important part to producers and the agriculture industry. So this is a quarterly report from, from USDA NAS, and, and there's a lot of details in the report. I'll, I'll encourage readers to take a look at it. The one piece of data that I like to take a look at is, is USDA does report quarterly the wage rate for animal workers. Now, realizing this is going to be a very aggregate number because there's a lot of different species we see animal workers for, and there's a lot of places across the country that we employ animal workers. But as we look at it, it, it continues to tell the same story that we really have a tight supply of workers. Wage rates continue to rise. They were up about 5% here as we compare April 2023 to April 2022. So again, it, it paints that same picture, higher wage rates. What's that mean? Higher cost to producers, right? So it's not only feed prices that we see elevated, right? And I like to remind folks that those factors are the ones we talk a lot about, right? You know, we talk about where corn prices are and how that's impacting feed prices and how that's impacting total costs. But there's a lot of other factors that matter when it comes to cattle production, right? And labor is one of them. We continue to see labor rates higher. Uh, that means increased cost to producers and increased cost to produce the products. And you recently wrote an article that kind of goes over a few things that producers might want to keep in mind as they move forward. This is one of uh, probably one of more enjoyable articles to write because we were we're in an upward cattle market, right? So, um, you know, I think first highlighting where we are, I think one thing to keep in mind is, you know, as we've talked about prices on this segment, as we look at cattle prices, they're relatively strong, right? And when we compare to history, some of them are record prices, right? At least nominally, when we control for inflation, not quite as high as, as we maybe seen back in 2014, but they're near record prices, right? So when you think about near record prices, you may think about near record profits, but that's not necessarily where we're at because we have record high costs too. So profits are relatively modest right now for producers, but expectation that we're going to see continued increase in profits as prices hold and, and potentially increase here moving forward and maybe hopefully moderation in costs. So thinking about, you know, right now where we are in the cattle cycle and producers are thinking, I think, about expansion, maybe not executing that expansion yet, but thinking about it, I think it's important to, to keep in mind, you know, where we should make some investments and, and when we should make some of those investments. So you want to make investments that, that are there for the long haul. You know, I'll, I'll go back to 2014 and when we were seeing the last expansionary phase in, in the cattle cycle and some of the prices that were paid for replacement heifer, right? They were historically strong prices. And at the time, they made a lot of sense because we were seeing really high cattle prices. We had ex expectation for a long run of, of very high cattle prices. Now, that necessarily didn't pan out 
maybe the way many have expected. So some of those really high replacement heifer prices, I marketed the calves from those heifers then years down the road at lower calf prices. So that investment uh, maybe didn't necessarily pencil out. Now, you know, I think it may be pencil out over the whole cow herd, uh, but, you know, prices for those individual heifers, you know, maybe were a bit too high given, you know, hindsight's 2020, but looking back. So I think keeping in mind where I can make some of the, the best investments, because the last thing you want to do is right now is invest, 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 and then a couple of years down the line, liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. So I think it's making some of those investments for the long term, investing in, in genetics, investing in the forage base, either quantity or quality, you know, making improvements on the operation, reducing debt is a big return on investment often. And I feel like all this really encapsulate risk mitigation. And that's something important in our industry. It is. And really, it's at the forefront of a lot of things I talk about. So like I'll remind folks, you know, going back to late 2014 to late 2015, there was a dramatic change in the cattle market. Right. And so as you've seen record profits or near record profits in 2014 to, to very large losses in 2015, you know, that highlights the need for risk management. And, I, and the, in the context of today is as you look at feeder cattle prices, they are some of the highest prices we ever seen. There's a lot of money at stake. So I think it's important to, to keep in mind the, the factors that you can control, and that's price risk management. There's a lot of tools available that allow you to at least have some insurance or, or put a floor on some of these prices. I think you want to keep the upside open, potentially, as you look at you know possible strength in prices, but also mitigate what could be potentially lower prices here, um, at least seasonally as we go through the next couple of months. That was Iowa State University Extension Livestock Economist Lee Schultz. We will link his resources that he mentioned in today's show on actoday.net in the show notes. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and usually on Monday, we have a wildlife segment. However, due to Memorial Day, we've moved it to Tuesday. And in to talk about wildlife is K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. Drew, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Shelby. And so today, you want to talk about deer and feeding deer and kind of a whole scope of their nutrition, drawbacks of doing it possibly, and then also disease. And so to get started, just talking about the nutritional needs of deer. For sure. So if we think about deer and what they eat and what they need and all those sorts of things, sometimes some of the popular information that we see doesn't necessarily match up with what the science says. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. And if we just start with thinking about what deer eat, if we look at information from an, across the entire country, about 46% of white-tailed deer diet is made up of browse. And so when we're talking about browse, that's the leaves, twigs, and bark from woody plants. About 24% or a quarter of their diet is made up of forbs, and that's what biologists tend to call broadleaf plants that most people would either call a wildflower or a weed. About 11% of their diet is made up of mast, which is a fancy name for nuts and fruit, and 8% grass, 4% crops, and then just a few other things. So if you'll note, corn was not a big thing in there that we talked about, but deer are typically browsers. Their diet is most like that of a sheep or a goat, if we're thinking about relating them back to livestock. And so all of these things combine together to help meet their nutritional needs. That's right. So if we think about the nutritional needs of deer, they're just like all other critters. They need macronutrients and micronutrients and those sorts of things. But if we just think about the macronutrients of energy and protein specifically, protein is one of the things that many hunters focus on a lot when they're thinking about providing nutrition to deer. And that's because protein is one of the things that's important for antler growth and development. So they want to see large antlers on deer to be able to harvest. And if we look at the the nutritional demands for protein of white-tailed deer, basically what we're looking at is the peak during the summertime when those antlers are growing from April to August, they're going to need about 16% crude protein in their diet. And that is what a lot of the feeds focus on is providing protein. But if we look at the natural availability of protein on the landscape, the average during that summertime period 
from just browse is going to be about 16 to 18 percent, depending on which month of the year you're looking at. But then if we look at a whole bunch of wild weeds and those sorts of things out there, things like pokeweed and blackberry, partridge pea, which is a native wild legume that's going to be out there, ragweed, goldenrod, and those sorts of things, they're providing much, much more than that 16 percent protein that deer need. We can also think about energy. The peak demand for energy in white-tailed deer is typically going to be during that same time of the year, during June through October, especially for lactating does during that time period. And what we see in that case as well is the energy availability on the landscape in our wild plants, whether they're native or not, is much exceeding what the deer need. And I think the point of this part is that Deer nutrition in the part of the world that we live in, where we have lots of high-quality nutrient availability in the soil, and that translates to this being a good area for crop production, right? So when you're in good areas for crop production, you're typically going to have plenty of abundant nutrients on the landscape to meet the needs of critters like deer. Really, the landscape is providing enough nutrients for deer, so people who choose to feed them more are just taking on financial costs. They can be, yes, that's very true. So if we look at the cost of providing protein just as one measure of the cost of feeding wildlife, if we look at the cost of just prescribed fire alone in hardwood forest, that cost is about two cents per pound of forage. And if we break that down into cost per pound of protein, it's about nine cents per pound of protein. Food plots are a little more expensive in terms of producing protein at about four cents per pound of forage and 13 cents per pound of protein. And this is averaged across 10 years. And protein feed costs about 50 cents per pound of forage and about $2.50 per pound of protein. So much, much more expensive if we're feeding protein feed. And someone may say, well, I prefer to feed corn. The percentage of protein in corn is very low. So the reason that deer are eating corn, and we're talking about providing corn in a feeder, right? So the reason that the deer are eating that corn is to get energy rather than protein. So we're not providing that potentially limiting nutrient for antler growth and that sort of thing by putting a corn feeder out there. Interesting point I found before we started. There's a correlation between feeders and possibly them looking a little more nocturnal for deer. Yeah, at least one study found that individual deer became more nocturnal around feeders or when they were concentrating their activity around feeders than in areas away from feeders. And so while deer definitely concentrate around feeders and high abundance of feed on the landscape, they may, individual deer, that specific buck that you're looking for, may be nocturnal around that feeder. So that is one potential benefit of putting feeders out, right? It can increase hunting efficiency by concentrating deer on the landscape and making their movements and availability more easy to predict for hunters. But they might be more nocturnal in that one spot. And talking about concentrating things into one area, just because you want deer to only come doesn't mean other wildlife aren't also going to enjoy the corn. That's exactly right. So if you get on Facebook, you can probably find lots of different pictures of 20 or 30 raccoons underneath a deer feeder. When we concentrate feed on the landscape, then we concentrate lots of other wildlife. And so one drawback of that is we're providing food that we think we're providing for deer or we're intending to provide for deer, but we're paying for raccoon feed or skunk feed or opossum feed and that sort of thing around that feeder. The other challenge about that, sometimes when you increase the nutritional plane of an animal, you you make them more healthy and you can increase reproductive output of that animal. And so it's possible that by making raccoons fatter and that sort of thing, that they might also be producing more babies or having higher survival of their litters as well. And a common thing also with a lot of livestock is when we put them in a tighter area or more things are finding their way to one certain spot, an increase in diseases. That's exactly right. So some of the things we're talking about that relate back to livestock production relate directly back to wildlife management. 
When we concentrate animals, we see what we would call density-dependent effects when we're talking about wildlife. So the higher the density, the more often something occurs. And that definitely happens when we get a bunch of animals eating and defecating and that sort of thing in the same spot. And one study out of Mississippi found that parasite loads, gastrointestinal parasite loads produced by raccoons and deer, were two to three times higher in areas at feeders than they were in areas away from feeders. So one ramification of that could be higher parasite loads in our deer. Another ramification of that is that when we're walking in to fill a feeder, we're picking those things up on our boots and maybe our clothes, and we could potentially ingest one of those parasite eggs after we're taking our boots off and get a parasite ourselves. or we could be spreading them around on the landscape too when we're walking around and we have those things on us. Another concern to think about as we're thinking about these sorts of things are that a corn feeder is going to oftentimes have corn laying on the ground below it. And when corn is out in the environment, it can get fungi in it, and those fungi produce something called aflatoxins. And so a study out of Mississippi found that corn feeders sometimes contain these aflatoxins during any time of the year. And they found that all corn piles during the summer that had been on the ground for at least a week had levels of aflatoxin in them that were toxic to birds, even turkeys and quail, after one week. They also found that some corn piles that have been on the ground for at least a week contain levels of these aflatoxins that could be potentially toxic to white-tailed deer fawns. And Drew, to round us out on chronic wasting disease, which is also a concern in Kansas. So we have chronic wasting disease that's been detected in at least 54 counties in Kansas. It's a weird disease. It's like bovine spongiform encephalopathy or BSE, which is also called mad cow, scrapie in sheep as well. So it's caused by a misfolded protein. And because it's just a, a weird protein, it's really hard to kill. It can last in the environment a long time. So it's 10 times more abundant. There's 10 times more of these infectious prions in saliva than any other body fluid that deer have in them. So if we are artificially concentrating saliva on the landscape, then we're potentially concentrating those prions on the landscape as well. And then if other deer are coming and eating in those spots too, then we're potentially creating hot spots for disease transmission of this chronic wasting disease in deer on the landscape. So that's something that, that I'm very concerned about around deer feeders and that sort of thing, which There are concentrations of deer saliva on the landscape naturally. Licking branches are an example. Natural mineral licks are another example. But feeders are something we have control over, whereas those other things aren't. So that's one thing to think about. Drew, thank you for coming in and kind of giving us some information on feeding deer, but then also what maybe are some concerns with doing that. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. That was K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. You're listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's milk lines. Because of the conditions, dairy farmers often see an onslaught of mastitis in the herd during the summer. K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook says that vaccinating for E. coli, removing or limiting access to ponds and other wet areas, and proper stall maintenance can all help to prevent the spread of summer mastitis. Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers about mastitis during the summertime in our dairy herds across the state. As we look uh, forward to uh, summertime and warmer temperatures, mastitis becomes more of a problem for us on most of our dairy farms. There's several reasons for that. Number one, the warmer temperatures just increase the rate at which the microorganisms that cause mastitis multiply. So they're more prevalent. Cows also tend to seek areas that are moist to uh, lay in. So again, you have greater contact with the teat ends into items that would contain high levels of bacteria. So what do we do on our dairy farms to help control the onslaught of mastitis that we sometimes see during the summertime? Well, number one, 
Hopefully you're on a vaccination program for E. coli. That is probably one of the types of mastitis that we deal with the most in the summertime that really create uh, some significant issues for us. Keeping in mind that the bacteria that cause E. coli types of mastitis generally produce toxins which are very detrimental to the animal's health and in some cases may actually cause the animal to die. So the vaccination program, making sure you're current uh, with your uh, pre-fresh cows as well as your fresh cows. Those vaccines, if you happen to be using one that requires three doses each year, make sure that uh, that is in fact what you're doing so that you get maximum control of the E. coli types of mastitis in your herd. Now, keep in mind that uh, just because we vaccinate animals for E. coli does not necessarily mean that we are going to be totally free of it. I would encourage you that while we may uh, still see some E. coli mastitis in the herd, even though we've vaccinated, those cases will not be near as severe and animals will recover much quicker from those challenges than if we did not vaccinate. Secondly, we need to try to remove and limit access to things like ponds and other areas that are wet that the animals would lay. This is true for both dry cows as well as our lactating herd. So controlling moisture that gets to the uh, tea dens is very, very important. So if we have those areas where animals uh, start to lay and they're actually laying in very wet areas, Fencing those areas off or moving the animals to a different area of the pasture, if that uh, be the case, are very important. If we have wet areas in our barns, uh, in our alleys, we need to make sure that uh, we uh, try to limit those as much as possible and, again, try to limit access that animals might have to those areas. Final thing I guess I would uh, suggest for effective control of mastitis during the summertime, and this is uh, particularly true of the environmental types of mastitis, your stall maintenance, making sure that uh, you're sanding or bedding uh, your stalls on a regular basis, that uh, each time animals are removed from the uh, pen, we rake the uh, manure out of the back of the stall if it's present, just trying to keep a very clean place for the udder to rest when she lies down. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to be diligent in their uh, fight against mastitis this summer. Thanks, Mike. And this reminder to listen to Agriculture Today anytime, go to agtoday.net, agtoday.net, where you can listen on demand and find links to subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Stitcher Radio. You can also subscribe on your mobile device using any podcast app, including Apple, Spotify, Chrome, and Stitcher. Simply type the search terms Agriculture, Today, Kansas, and you'll find this program. Simply tap the subscribe button, and new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically arrive on your device each weekday. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.